Okay. So, 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 so the way that, you know, they had overlapping waves. Right. Okay. So both, you know, so you had wave one and wave two people there. Right. And, and they, um, so during the, the reception, they said, um, okay, everybody go outside. We want to show you something and everything. Go outside. And, and uh, it, was, it was really freakish weather there. I mean, it was, it was like raining. I mean, it would be, it would be sunny. And I mean, it would be it would be raining, but I mean, I'm not talking like like gentle like buckets. It was like rain. <laughs> but anyway, so so they they take us out into this this courtyard in front of the hotel, and they have a car covered, and uh, they said, okay, here it is. Hmm. And uh, you know, they said that you know Korea Market is the big market for that car, and you know it hadn't even been shown there. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Wow. They did a lot of work on that car, too. Yeah. I mean, a lot of sheet metal was changed. Wow. And, uh, Which car is that? Elantra? Yeah. To me, it looks a lot like the Jetta, the, the front-end graphic. If, if, you see, if you see it in real life... It what, doesn't? What it, no, what it looks like is <clears throat> it's gone back a generation to when it was swoopier and edgier, mm -hmm. you know, just as they took the, the you know, the, after um, the 2011 Sonata, which was, you know, very formed and shaped, mm -hmm. and then they did the Elantra after that, and then the next generation of both of those vehicles were made more subdued. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so they they just, they're doing the mid-cycle refresh on the Elantra, and it's it's gone, like, much edgier. Oh, and, really? And, it, and it, so it seems to have gone it's back again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reactive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody who's already tuned in. We're going to take a deep dive into the Acura RDX. We got uh, Stephen Fry, the chief engineer on that vehicle here. And if you'd like to ask a question, shoot us an email. Send it to viewermail at autoline.tv. If you want to call in with a question, we'll pop up the number right now. And that is 620-288. 6546, and we're going to get going in just a minute. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. All right, we get to do another show again, Gary. Indeed. All I right. like doing these things. I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. You? I'm doing perfect. You know, we're going to be talking later about the super handling all-wheel drive that this RDX has. And it just so happens that in 1904, on this day, there was a patent granted for tire chains. So I just want you to know that Harold D. Weed of Canistoga, New York, got a patent for tire chains. Imagine that. <laughs> well, boy. I feel so much better. Now that you know that, so if anybody ever asks you, it was the patent is grip tread for pneumatic tires. So it's just pretty astounding. Just think about that, 1904. 1904. Okay. They already knew that they needed tire chains. Exactly. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Hey, we got to let everybody know Lindsey Brook from SAE Engineering is with us. Mm. Good having you on the show, Lindsey. Thanks for having me, John. Always, always a blast. Yeah, yeah, no, it's always good. And our special guest today is St Stephen Fry, the chief engineer with the Acura RDX. And Stephen, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. So, and we've got a cutaway of your, of your car here, the RDX. What surprised me is this is a completely clean sheet design, yeah. and it's Acura specific. I thought the only way that anybody in the car industry these days could make money is by sharing as many components across the board as possible, having a platform or an architecture sure, sure. that uh, multiple brands can use. Why is this all clean sheet? Why is it Acura only? Well, we did. We took a calculated risk with this car. You know, we knew this was going to be the first in a new generation that we wanted to execute for Acura. And, you know, we've returned to precision crafted performance for our concept. And so to meet that kind of target, we knew we needed a brand new platform. So it was a big risk, but we went all in on this. We've got a brand new body, all new chassis, 
a new turbocharged powertrain for this car and what I'm most excited about, which we had already mentioned, the return to SH all-wheel drive for the RDX. Mm -hmm. So, so some skeptical person like Walt well, Lindsay say, sure, oh, sure. <laughs> is, is, is going is, is to look at this and say, is, is, is this a CRV? Ah, that's a that's a that's a reasonable question to ask. Uh, but but again, when we looked at the targets for this car, you know, in terms of appeal, we really wanted to increase the emotion. And so there were three areas we were looking at: the design to make an alluring exterior design, and to do that, we needed to stretch the car and make it look more powerful. So we increased the width and the wheelbase and reduced the front overhang at the same time to give it a great proportion. Okay, but in terms of performance we set high targets, specifically about the body rigidity. And so when we looked at the existing platforms that we had, they just weren't gonna be sufficient to meet those targets. So we ended up with this, this body, which is actually, it, it's a fantastic result of the engineering that went into it. We increased the stiffness by 38%, and something that I think we're really proud of at Acura, we just received the highest safety award possible from IIHS. We got the top safety pick plus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was one of the targets that we had set during development, and we needed a new platform to execute that. Stephen, can you talk about, you know, for years, the Honda Motor Company, it, it's always been the world's engine maker. Sure. And for the last 10 years, you guys have really pushed the envelope in body structures. And we're getting into this with this car. Mm -hmm. Ace body structures, they keep getting better and better and better. Talk about the priority at, within the organization about excellent body structures and, and engineering. Yeah, and, and you know, I think it's interesting. Like, making a body that's rigid is actually an easy engineering solution. Making a car that's stylish is easy to do. Making it stylish, rigid, and have the cargo capacity that a CUV needs, that's the magic. You know what I mean? I mean, there's only so much space. So the body engineers have to decide how to execute all these targets in the limited space that we're given them. And, you know, and one of the big achievements here in this car, it's a world's first application. We've got the first in the automotive industry, hot stamped inner and outer door rings. This is made from steel. It's 1,500 megapascal tensile strength. That's just the strongest stuff you can get out there. And we've put it across the entire front door, inside and out. That was one of the ways that we're able to achieve those targets and be mindful of the packaging and the weight. Another thing, when I look at this cutaway, and I love how you have it painted different colors for the different sure. grades of steel and yeah. all that, but uh, for the front overlap test, the small front overlap that the IIHS does, uh, the, you, you have sort of this flying buttress in yellow here that, yeah. that we're, we're looking at. But I remember the first iteration of that, which I think was on the Odyssey, was it? Or was that on the MDX? But what I'm getting at is this looks far simpler. Uh, not as many extra ba uh, brackets or gussets or that. Do, yeah. Am I picking up on that right? Yeah. Or? yeah, and that's the evolution in our design. You know, we're still continuing with the concept of our ACE body construction, but it's evolved to be more efficient. And the regulations have changed. You know, the SOT test is new. And so our ability to perform well in that test, the result is this construction here. SOT being small overlap test. That's right, right. Yeah. that's right. Uh, is it, because you're using new grades of steel, you mentioned the, the hot stamp stuff on the, the door outer and inner, but is it higher grades or stronger grades of steel or are you just doing more iteration, more design? I mean, going through again and again and yeah. again to you optimize it's it. It's a little bit of both. In the engine room, it's more about our optimization but in the hot stamp door ring area, that's new material. I mean, this is, you know, that application doesn't exist in the automotive market today outside of the RDA. Okay, and, so, and so, 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 so our viewers who are keen viewers of this show may yeah. remember we had a cut body of the MDX on sure. the show, mm -hmm. yep. which we could see the hot stamp door ring, yeah. but that was simply the outer. That's right. So was that where this came from? Yep, that was the origin. This is an evolution of that type of design this construction uh, allowed us to make the body so rigid and so safe from a safety perspective, we actually reduced over 10 kilograms of weight with this inner and outer hot stamp door ring because we were able to eliminate gussets and stiffeners and reinforcements that were required with the old construction. So it just became much more efficient from a, from a weight standpoint. If you have fewer uh, brackets and gussets and all that, I gotta believe there's slightly less tooling cost? Yes. You're not yeah. tooling as many pieces for That's it. That's true, yep. Yeah, so it, it's a real win-win for us. And, and although the viewers of the show are technically very astute, some might not know what hot stamping is. Sure, Could you sure. quickly run through that? Yeah, simply, we, we have a specially prepared material, and actually this is a special application. 
We used Taylor welding blanks for this. So not only do we have this high strength steel, but we're able to optimize the cost of this part. So the blank is the sheet of steel. That's right. It's a flat piece of steel. And we cut that into five different pieces to make the outer ring. And then we laser weld it together. This allows us to be efficient with the blanking size, but it also we can weld different thicknesses together. So the outer ring has three different thickness materials. We put the thick stuff where we needed it and the thin stuff where we didn't. And then that's heated up to 900 degrees C and it's, it's put in a giant press and it's stamped to the final shape in one stamp. Is it heated in the press before the ram comes it, down? It, it's heated as it's rolling into the press up to 900 C. The ram comes down, stamps the part and immediately cools it. There's cooling uh, passages inside the die itself. Mm -hmm immediately quenches it, and that's where it gets that strength. So it's like it goes through a pizza oven. It's it exactly does, like and, a pizza and, oven. And, yeah. and, and, <laughs> it's, it's awfully quick. It's amazing to see how oh, fast yeah. these blanks heat up. Yeah. And I mean red hot. Right, oh, yeah. Right, right. And then bang, and then it cools it right down, and what you're left with is an incredibly strong piece of okay, steel. So, so for our less astute audience members. <laughs> for the stupid people watching. No, 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 no. no. Two percent of the audience. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, so, In fact, so, it might be sitting right here. So, yeah. Yeah. Present. <laughs> so, so, so the question is, is that, okay, so, you know, 1,500 megapascal steel yep. and, you know, blah, 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 blah. What does that mean for someone who buys this vehicle? That's a good question. When you buy this vehicle, you're going to have confidence that this car is going to be safe. In the unfortunate event you're in a crash, this is the car to be in. And does it, does it help in terms of NVH or? Um... Yeah. Um, so really two primary. Uh, it's our safety achievement for side crash and SOT, but also for body rigidity. We've put an ultra wide panoramic moon roof in these cars and it, it puts a giant hole in the roof. So cross, cro cross car strength is a concern. And so these hot stamp door rings are so rigid, it allowed us to tie the bottom and top of the car very effectively. Hmm. So, so otherwise, if you have that big hole up there that you sort of like it gets That's right. wobbly. Yep, yep. And so these rings were, were one of the ways we achieved the rigidity targets that we had set. And before the show started, you were talking to me about this pipe that goes yeah. through under the back seat. Mm -hmm. What's that about? That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great little trick. So the mid-floor cross member, that's real estate that you're fighting for to increase the tank capacity or to improve the interior packaging. Because you got the fuel tank under the back seat. That's right, it sits right under the back seat. So we're always trying to make the tank more efficient and larger uh, to get a longer driving range, but it compromises the seating space, seat comfort and heel space. And so in that mid-floor cross member, we kept the section narrow, but we put a pipe from, from the left to right side of the car to increase its stiffness. And it was, it was a real solution for us. So you guys are really, really advanced in, um, in, in FEA analysis and, and uh, virtual engineering sure. to put these together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The entire car is built before it ever is a real piece of steel. This car exists in a computer somewhere. So where is that car built? Uh, East Liberty, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's the world source of... For the RDX, that's right. Hey, yep. Now, this, actually, this car will be a global car. Uh, we are going to produce this in China and... Um, uh, we're finishing up the process of getting that ready for production. Um, it's largely exactly the same design here. There's a few unique things in China uh, that we've applied, but basically this car will be sold in China as well and produced in China. Steve, will we see some of this technology? John had mentioned this is a unique body structure, but will we see some of it in pilot and CRV and other vehicles? Yeah, no, this, this really, you know, this is an accurate exclusive platform. Hmm. There's, some, there's some technology that we're moving forward for some of the future Acura models. We made a brand new seat. Um, brand new seat frame. It's got 16-way power function. That's going to move forward in our Acura products. Uh, we made a brand new multi-link rear suspension. That's going to move forward in some of our Acura products. When they moved this uh, cutaway into the studio, I was walking around it because I love looking at these yeah. things. And Carmen, I don't know if you got that picture. It looks like the claw marks in the in the front bumper beam, but uh, there's like these. Th there it is. The, the, what the hell is that? <laughs> those, are, those are manufacturing die marks. That's where we're holding the part when that part's being made. So it, it's an extruded aluminum bar. That, that's right. And, yep. uh, and so you, you grab it there and then you bend it. That's right. That's okay. right. Yeah. So th those are there on purpose. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love seeing details like that. So, so, so speaking of aluminum, is, is there any aluminum sheet metal on the car? Yeah, we do. We have an aluminum hood uh, on this car, but primarily we went with higher strength steel for the body construction. Mm -hmm. um, and then where it made sense to spend money on the aluminum components, we did that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let, let's go to the rockers because uh, there's these like little tongue-like things that yeah. stick up. Here, we got a picture there of it are. right yep. there. <laughs> uh, they're on the yellow uh, right there, and they, they just sort of, again, what are yeah. they there for? Yeah, so this construction is unique. With this inner and outer door ring, we needed an EA absorber What's at the EA? bottom, uh, energy absorber. Mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted that uh, along the bottom of the car there for side crash. And this design is pretty unique. Those tabs are actually where that's held from the inner and outer door ring, but the absorber is floating inside that cross section. So it's almost like a, a, a rocker within a rocker. That's right, mm. yeah. And then during the crash event, then that absorber starts to do its job once the pillar starts to get connected with the barrier. And its job is just crush. To absorb energy, <laughs> yes. And, and, and to be clear for those who are watching, I mean, the, the two red pieces would come together when this is assembled. Yeah, so, we so. have this blown away so you can see what's going on inside there. Right. And if this was blown away in a typical car, what you'd see is a lot of reinforcements and stiffeners in there to try mm -hmm. to gain that strength. But mm -hmm. basically, it's completely empty inside this ring. There's a big body engineering conference in Germany that I think they award awards to. Are you taking this over there? Uh, we are considering that strongly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of work goes into doing a cutaway like this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how much time, how many people did you throw at this? Yeah, our fabrication group took a lot of pride in making this. You know, this, this, this vehicle is basically built by hand, um, and they tape it off, and they paint it. They're, they're wet sanding this in between paint coats. So they take it serious. This is a very serious project, and it's just beautiful. You know, this is something that we can display our technology with, and so, you know, we certainly do put a lot of effort into it. It looks cool. Hey, we got a, a phone call here from one of our viewers. Carmen, let's bring that in. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dick Lembitz calling from York, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> As a proud owner of the Honda uh, touring model Odyssey, I've always wondered, has there ever been any consideration given to making the Acura model a little bit taller, a little bit higher, and making one out of their body? for the Acura badge. I'll sit back and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the call. Yeah. Well, we do have the MDX, which is a taller, wider body than the RDX here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the biggest uh, vehicle we have in the Acura lineup. But unfortunately, for future models, I do not have the liberty to speak about those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the old then we'd have to kill you kind yeah, of. Yeah, sorry about right. that. So, so you guys engineered this car in Raymond, Ohio. We did, yep. And designed it in Torrance? Los Angeles, yep, in Torrance, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it was a great relationship with those guys. You know, developing a car, the designers have the image of what the car is supposed to look like, and then the engineers in Ohio have to make it a reality. And I think, you know, we have some sketches in the beginning. The car held the image so closely. Um, you know, everybody was really so, so happy with that. So, so, I mean, what if you, you were talking about how the, the real estate, just to get that tube yeah. was, you know, something you probably had to negotiate over. Okay, mm. w when you're doing the exterior design of the vehicle, what sorts of negotiations went on between yeah. designers and engineers? I think the, the biggest one, and this is pretty typical with a CUV, the exterior styling, what they're looking for is kind of a strong stance, so the tumble home look to where the cabin looks like it's in and the wheels are out. To get that design from a styling perspective is very attractive, but it compromises the interior packaging. I mean, this is a CUV. People are buying this with the expectation that they want to carry things. You know what I mean? So the fight in the rear of the car to make it look small, but when you open the tailgate, be big, that's the challenge. <laughs> and is this package protected for hybridization? Well, for future powertrains, again, I'm not allowed to speak about those. <laughs> well, tell us but about I this think powertrain. it's a good guess, okay. Lindsay. <laughs> so, but tell us, so this is a new, new this is a brand this new car. powertrain for us. This is our two liter turbo, uh, 272 horsepower, but 280 foot pounds of torque. And it's available from 1600 RPM. So this is really a driver's car. With a 10 speed up. That's right. The only 10 speed in the segment. And then, like I mentioned, our next generation super handling all wheel drive. Mm -hmm. But before we leave the, the engine, so the first sure. generation RDX had a turbo. That's right. The second generation RDX didn't have a turbo. Right. Now, this, the third generation, goes back to the turbo. Why? Yeah, well, you know, that was th this was something that we, you know, we considered this deeply. The previous generation, the second generation RDX, honestly, is very well received. We're coming from a position of strength. It's the only, it's the only car in our segment that's got three years of 50,000 sales per year. So we have customers that appreciate the second generation RDX. 
So we wanted to make sure we didn't do anything to dissatisfy those guys, but we wanted to bring in new customers. You know, so the viewpoint of making the car much more appealing, but from a driving perspective, we wanted to deliver confidence. And so to inst instill more confidence, this powertrain has more low-end torque. Do you know what I mean? So when you're pulling out in front of people, it gives you more confidence. Without this, having to mash the that's pedal right. down. Mm. So this was a better solution for us to deliver that next step in performance, mm. at least in this segment. Yeah, no, very interesting how torque can tie into confidence. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was one of the big themes for us. You know, the super handling is a confidence builder in my mind. It's not something to where you need to be on a rally course, you know, trying to really push the limits of four-wheel drive. It's everyday benefit. And if customers don't recognize it, it's working. Like every day when I come to work, I've got to take a left-hand turn with oncoming traffic. And previously, that left me a little uneasy pulling out into traffic like that. With this car, with the SHO wheel drive, I have that immediate torque response. The right rear wheel is pushing me through the turn and I'm right into traffic and it, it's just, I mean, confidence is the word that we were going for, but that's how I feel when I'm driving it with the SH. And how does, that, how does the new SH system differ from the previous one? Significantly. So we've increased its capacity by 40%. It's torque capacity. That's right, excuse me, torque capacity by 40%. And then for this RDX, we can deliver 70% of the engine's torque to the rear end and 100% of it to the left or right side. Hmm. So true torque vectoring and the response of the power to each one of the rear wheels is increased by about 30%. So it's a much more responsive and powerful system. Hey, we're gonna have to take a quick break here, but before we do, we got a question from Jeff Taylor in St. Louis, Missouri. He says, I'm interested to know whether the new RDX uses laminated or tempered glass for the panoramic sunroof. Uh, if it uses tempered glass, where there are other reasons than cost, he says, Consumer Reports has written a few times about the increasing frequency of shattering panoramic moon roofs, and using laminated glass seems like it would be a good idea. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That is something that we considered during the development. This is tempered glass uh, that we've applied here. It's four millimeters thick. Um, there are considerations that we made during the development to improve the NVH characteristics, uh, et cetera, but what we decided on was the best balance was to continue with the tempered glass. Okay, good. Yeah. Hey, look, we're going to take a quick commercial break right now. we got a lot more to get into on okay, this great. vehicle yet. We'll be back with Stephen Fry, but first, a shout out to our friends at Borg Warner. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All about, right, we're, all, we're back talking all about the uh, Acura RDX, but this is the part of the show where Dr. Data brings up his number. Okay, <laughs> so, so you, get to, you get to participate. So okay. in, in case you don't know, there'll be, in this case, a set of numbers, and you try to figure out what these numbers might represent. Okay, I'm gonna do my best. So Katie, could we have the number, please, the first slide? Okay, so total number of trips 96,255, total distance of said trips, 163,405 miles, and the average trip length, 1.7 miles. So all of those numbers go together. And it has something to do with the world of transportation. Mm -hmm. That is the drive that you take to work every day. Now I'm gonna say it's odd. Uh, the number of autonomous miles that Waymo has delivered uh, for uh, ride sharing. They're both good guesses. <laughs> They're both wrong. Both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and and if, I, if I drove to work 96,000 times, I mean, geez, how long would I have? You don't go back and forth to work every day like yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lindsay, pressure, pressure's on you. I, I was going to say uh, a typical Uber uh, vehicle. All right. so. That's a good guess too, but also wrong. <laughs> and and I, I gotta tell you, this surprised me. This, this is astonishing. Huh. Answer please. The first three weeks of scooter use in Portland, Oregon. They're getting it done. 
They're getting it done. Can you imagine that? So that means these things are really popular. Yeah. You're talking about these little bird electric yeah. Yeah. scooters. Bird, lime, that sort of thing. Okay. Someone has coined the phrase scooter Mageddon out there. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and apparently there was a show out there, how this whole thing kind of erupted, where there was a show out there. It might have been autonomous. It might have been a software show. But the supplier just scattered these on the street and picked them up. And they're all over the place out there. Mm -hmm really kind of dangerously in some ways, too. It's just people getting on them, and they're all over the place, and, you know, they're not obeying crosswalks or scooter lanes or... Well, so that was from the Portland Bureau of Transportation, so trust me, they're safe. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I mean it's, it's like, who would think that so many people would use those scooters? I mean, yeah. the first three weeks, that many trips? That's incredible. It really is. Hmm. Okay, let's go back to the RDX. And one of the things that we did is pull off one of the rear wheels here because that suspension, the rear suspension, looks pretty impressive. I mean, this thing looks like it came off a Formula One race car or something. <laughs> Thank you. It's a multi-bar, a multi-link multi car. Yep. Yeah, and so, you know, our goal with this car you know, combined with this brand new powertrain was to make the, quick the quickest, best handling RDX ever, okay? Mm -hmm. The quickness is coming from our powertrain. The best handling is coming from the body rigidity, but also our chassis. And so we made this new multi-link rear suspension, but the key for a rear suspension to perform properly, like the stiffness has to go all the way through from the tire patch to the knuckle, to the subframe, to the body. That entire connection is critical for things like yaw delay and response for the vehicle. So we needed a high performance rear suspension to get that done. You know, honestly, in the previous model, there was a little bit of a weak link there uh, with the body. Mm -hmm. And so we redesigned this suspension to work with our body. And you can see with the blue paint in the rear there, this is our dual ring rear frame construction. This is something that we have not done before. This is brand new for the RDX. But what it does is it effectively takes the input loads from the rear suspension and it splits them into a Y. They travel through the C pillar and also the rear roof frame there. And so that type of distribution allowed us to solve the problem with the exterior stylist wanting to bring it in and me wanting a lot of cargo capacity. See, I love this kind of detail because I think it helps everybody appreciate just how much engineering yes. goes into something like yes. that. And Steve, this looks to be an isolated rear cradle, is that it right? It is, yep. And, and the front cradle is the same? Yes. So obviously a luxury buyer also wants good ride quality in addition to handling. Yeah, yeah, and that was something that we really focused on, um, the improvement of the ride comfort. You know, the interior of the cabin, we kind of pictured like a sanctuary. You know, we've outfitted it with premium materials, but we really focused on improving the NVH, the noise, vibration, and harshness in the car. And so with the rear suspension, mechanical compliance is something that we really tried to improve. I, I recently drove through your, your PR folks uh, an R-Spec version a couple weeks ago. The word I kept coming up with was crisp. Everything about the car was crisp. Yeah. Steering was crisp, braking was crisp, uh, turn in. Uh, it was just really, you know, shift quality. I mean, that's what this car is to me, is crisp. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, certainly that was our goal. You know, and that is an expression, I believe, of confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, you, what you expect the vehicle to do, it does. Mm -hmm. that, that was our goal. So, you know, you mentioned quietness. Um, so you guys use an acoustic spray that you've we, never used yes, before? Yeah, so we, we really... You know, we really increased the NV materials that we used. We've got, we've got acoustic spray in a lot of the pillars. Mm -hmm. We increased the carpet thickness. We've got laminate glass on the driver and the windshield. Um, you know, we, we've, we have hydro mounts on the rear subframe to isolate the cabin that way. Um, so we really tried to focus on quieting the cabin down. And again, that was something that probably we needed to improve on the second generation RDX. Another thing, I want to go back to that rear suspension, if we can bring that picture back up again, because it didn't hit me until I saw the picture. The calipers on the brakes, so that, that's like, those are different than anything I've ever noticed before. Yeah, well, we've got, this is an, uh, an electronic parking brake combined with our caliper oh, back there, gotcha. so it's serving two oh, functions okay. that way. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you split the the line between having a vehicle that, as, as Lindsay says, is crisp, but on the other hand, sort of gives you this feeling of luxury yeah. that is, you know, tends to be some isolation. Yeah. There, there's, there's two ways to do that. You're never going to go wrong with a rigid body. That sets everything up. If you have a rigid body, you can soften up the mounts between the suspension and the body. You know, when the body is lacking rigidity, the mounts need to become stiffer. 
to maintain your dynamic target. So the body rigidity was one of the big success stories for us. We've also added uh, an advanced control damper to the car to where we do have uh, three or four different settings on the car with the control damper so where you can soften it up if you're on the highway or you can tighten up the suspension, you know, if you're somewhere in Pennsylvania zipping through the twisties. <laughs> <laughs> As a chief engineer, you had mentioned all these new features. How difficult is it, Steve, to maintain a mass target while you're adding these great features? Yeah, that, that's a big challenge. Everybody's faced with that challenge today. And there, you know, you can throw exotic materials at it to reduce weight, but they come with a cost penalty. So engineering is the key for us. Um, you know, this body, 38% stiffer, top safety pick plus, we have all the capacity in the cargo area, the body's 20 kilograms lighter than the previous Man. model. So, and that's a steel intensive body too. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right Knight wants to know, any thoughts uh, while you were developing it of having this a rear drive platform? Uh, that wasn't part of our direction, no, no. Uh, this this uh, platform direction uh, was the same from the start. We also got a question from Jonathan Bergman, who was an intern who worked with us this summer. Okay. He says, I got a question for your RDX engineer. In your opinion, Stephen, mm -hmm. how can engineers make infotainment systems more intuitive? That's a great question. <laughs> and, you know, it, I don't know if it's the elephant in the room in the automotive industry, but everyone is searching for a solution for infotainment. We're getting a lot of feedback from our customers, both positive and negative, about our current systems. And knobs, so, no knobs. That's right. And so, you know, we took a big risk with, we developed a brand new infotainment system from this car. You know, it's the most powerful system we've ever created. The goal, though, was to make a system that was easy to use while you're driving the car. Great. And my goal was to make it easy to learn. You know, if, when you get in the car for the first time, you know, there's some, there's a little bit of a learning process on how to interact with that car. And so one of the goals was to make it easy to learn so people can quickly get acclimated to how they use their car. And this system is actually, it's very unique. There's nothing like this in the industry. Um, we've got a world's first application in the automotive uh, segment. We have an absolute position touchpad. Now, uh, this system is unique in that. In the, in the segment today, there's a lot of touch screens for the infotainment interaction, and they're actually quite intuitive. You can look at the screen, there's an icon on there, you touch it with your finger, and you can select it. This is terrific, though, in a static situation. When you're driving the car, it does require you to bring your eyes down to the touch screen. It needs to be close and low so you can reach it, and lift your arm up and touch the screen. So we were looking for something that reduced the amount of time that you were looking away from the road. We took the screen and we wanted to keep kind of the image of the touch screen, but ours is a display screen. We moved it high and forward on the dash. And so while you're driving down the road, it's very close to your line of sight, okay? But we needed a remote input device. And so after thousands and thousands of hours of research, honestly, and looking at every different input device in the world, this absolute position touchpad was our solution. We've placed it ergonomically right where you want to rest your right hand. And it's shaped in such a way to where when your hand lies on the touchpad, you know where you are in the top left corner or the bottom right corner. And we've mapped it one to one with the display screen. So if you want to pick the icon in the top left, you simply touch the top left of the touchpad and you can select that icon. There's a little bit of a learning curve because it's new. No one has this technology in their car. But once you get it, it's like that. I must say, it was the only thing I didn't like. Okay. And I thought, is this old guy syndrome? Yeah. Okay, am I not yeah. getting it? You know? Yeah. So I, I look forward to giving it another try, but on the first, first try, I thought, well, a little, maybe they've gone a little too far with yeah. this. And then you have that other thing to the side of it where you can yes. snap to... Yeah, we have, you know, our display screen is broken into two zones. What, what we heard and what I use all the time, people honestly want to interact with their navigation and their audio source. Those are the two primary things you're doing in the right. car. And so with our display screen, you can have both displayed at the same time, and the touchpad is separated in the same way. So my kind of normal use case, I've got navigation up in the big screen, and I've got my audio source on the right side. If I want to play with the audio, I can simply touch the right side, and it brings it over to the primary. But the navigation goes to the right side. They just kind of swap spaces. And again, this is something, it, it works a lot like smart devices that people have today. And so once you see how to use it, it's very, it's very easy to use while you're driving the car. And that, you know, that was our goal.
Do left-handed people have any problem with this? I'm a left-handed person. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just yeah. a turn me down. It's just I. No, that's why we have two hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, here's a tough one for okay. you. Uh, Michelle Matrega says, I've been an owner of an R RDX for about a month now, and every time it switches from second gear to third, it makes a jerking motion. When I took it to the mechanics, they didn't know what I was talking about and told me to drive it 2,000 miles more and see if it goes away. Is this a problem you've had with other cars as well? Well, one, that's not a great answer. But uh, this is something we are, you know, this is something that we're aware of and we're looking into. And, uh, you know, there's something that probably we'll be able to improve uh, in the near future about that shifting. There is a little bit of a shift shock in that area between two and three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's the same gearbox that was in that's used in the Odyssey, right? Yeah, it's a very similar. We've we've changed the the top end of this uh, transmission uh, to meet our performance targets, hmm. uh, and we've adapted it for four wheel drive. Okay. Yeah. Here's an easier question okay, for you. you. Mike from San Francisco yeah. says, given all the CUVs that are out there right now in a similar size and engine, what is the must have reason why somebody should get a 2019 RDX? Boy, there's about 100 reasons that I could talk about today. <laughs> just do 99. Just do 99? Right. Right. But, but, you know, it, it, like I had explained previously, this car already has a strong core base. You know, people like the second generation RDX, but this car is more appealing, more luxurious, more comfortable, and easier to operate. So I, that, that is more than one reason, but like that fits people's needs. They want a car that they're happy to own, and it's got to do what they want it to do. And so with our SH all-wheel drive, with our new infotainment system, which you know, I drive every day, and as soon as you get the hang of it, it is so easy to use. I think it answers those questions that people are looking for. Mm -hmm. Joe Pastor from San Antonio writes in to say, how much of the new infotainment and drivetrain technology will we see in the 2020 TLX? Surely you can give us a small hint. And to soften you up, he says, P.S. I've driven the new RDX, and it is as transformational a redesign of any Acura product I've ever experienced. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I mentioned, there are a number of the technologies in this car that are going to move forward in the Acura lineup. Certainly the powertrain and the infotainment are both of those. Mm -hmm. So, engineering this vehicle, because yeah. as you know, we've established clean sheet opportunity from the front to the rear sure. and over and under and around and through, all new. Because of the new efforts that are being made to position Acura in the market, I mean, were, were you given a little more latitude than you otherwise might have been? It, there was a lot of confidence in this vehicle from the start. You know, I can remember about halfway through our development, we had produced a car that drove and looked like the car that we're selling today. And our president, after the evaluation, came to me and said, Steve, you guys are going to break the factory meaning this is going to sell, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? And, right. and we knew we had something there. And so there was a lot of confidence inside Acura as we were developing this to get it to mass production. You talk about the competitive set. This is a red hot segment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm happy to say that the 2019 RDX, we've set back to back record sales months in June and July, and we're on track to set another record in August here. Mm -hmm. Pretty good stuff. Yeah. Philippe Lavoie writes in to ask, Apple CarPlay in the RDX does not use absolute positioning. Is this going to be modified in the future? No. And I, yeah. What is absolute positioning? Yeah. So absolute positioning is our touchpad. You know, if you can imagine, it's a rectangle, and the display screen is a rectangle. The top left corner of our touchpad corresponds to the display screen as well. Apple CarPlay works more like a laptop mouse to where you have a, and you can scroll around using the touchpad. So their um, input function, they wanted to keep the same as, for example, the Apple TV or your iPhone like that. So that functionality resides inside Apple, and I think it's going to stay that way inside the RDX. Gotcha. Uh, Albert uh, Maniscalco writes in to say, it finally looks halfway decent, <laughs> certainly better than the Lexus offerings. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and our inspiration for this, we debuted that, I believe, in 2017 at the LA Auto Show. We had the precision concept. This was the direction for Acura exterior styling, and this is the first full model change to where we've completely executed that, and it's come to reality. And many people have said, thank goodness for getting rid of that kind of brushed aluminum, like a hawk's nose beak. that was on the, pre the beak that was on the previous car. Yeah, yeah. and we, you know, we have refreshed uh, the majority of the Acura lineup with the new face of Acura with our diamond pentagon grille. Uh, and we've got you know, our signature LED lighting on the front of this car. 
Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that the uh, Insurance Institute's been harping on, yeah. headlamps. In fact, you can't even get a top safety pick plus rating unless your headlamps are really good. That's, if that's right. something that you really went after. Yeah, we did, and ours achieved a good rating, you know, in our top safety pick plus rating. Certainly, uh, we did achieve a good rating in that, and that was one of our development targets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are the kind of things that you have to think on well in advance when you're starting to put the pieces together for the car. You know, what are your top-level goals? Will this car continue to be developed uh, in North America? Uh, well, that's another great question, but talking about future products, I don't know that I'm at liberty to say that. <laughs> yeah, because I would say, you know, they got the MDX, a big one. They right. got the RDX, a middle one. There's got to be a baby one coming. <laughs> <laughs> I have no comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, good. I think we should wrap this segment up. But uh, Stephen Fry, thanks so much for coming it's in. It's been a lot. Especially bringing the, the yeah. cutaway with you. Yeah, it, dynamite. Me, it really helps to have this in the studio yep. when we do the shows. Thanks, guys, for having me. Yeah, no, it's been great. Okay, we're going to take another quick commercial break. We're going to come back. we got more news of the industry to talk about and probably some other things as well. AirConnexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. All right, we're back, talking about all things automotive. So there's reporting this week that the diesel Volkswagen situation... The story's not over. It, it will not die. I mean, so, so they're talking about... Firing a whole raft of people that may be involved with this, and, and, and maybe that uh, the new executive, uh, Herbert Dice at uh, Volkswagen, may be implicated. Um, you know, it was like a question of, you know, when, you know, what did he know and when did he know it? I mean, what do you guys make of this? Well, it shows that maybe Volkswagen hasn't come completely clean on, on this whole thing. And it's German prosecutors who are now digging up the latest stuff. And... Uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like they've got a handle on this situation at all. They, they have not managed the crisis completely. Well, and that it was far broader than anybody would have thought. You know, if you were going to cheat on something, wouldn't you kind of keep it between Gary and myself? And <laughs> Gary, no one's going to know about this if we decide to do this. But this is incredible, the way this is playing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely thought it was over. I mean, yeah. I, I thought that it was, it was behind them, they were moving on. You just have you to know. still pay a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, uh, you know, and then there was another thing about apparently uh, that cars may be de decertified in Germany if people don't bring their cars in to get them fixed. Now, I guess it's a, a very mm. small number, but, mm. uh, you know, what, what a strange thing that is. Ugh, you know. It's time that the story gets wrapped up and put to bed forever. So the, the, I, it, Volkswagen needs to step it up and get this thing done with. Yeah, the, the real tragedy is it has disparaged an engine that still has a lot of headroom, that still is a CO2 reduction machine in itself, that uh, the FEVs and AVLs of the world are still coming up with combustion technology to clean this up. And people think, I think the general public thinks that there's something wrong with diesel. It really wasn't diesel. It was the test method and trying to get around it. And, yeah. and ironically, as you guys know, we're seeing a lot of new diesels come into the market. An inline six from, from General Motors and Chrysler's going to bring theirs back. For and trucks, no problem. Trucks, Diesels no problem. are right. heavy demand for pickup trucks and the like. Right. Passenger cars, not so much. Well, it's killing the market in Germany. I mean, it's just, it's really fallen off. I, I, it's a shame. So... The Chevy Cruze has a diesel, doesn't it? It does. Do you have any idea how well that's doing? Not at no. all. It's not doing well. They, it's, I want to say, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but the last I looked, it was about a 5% take rate. 5% hmm. for a very expensive option. So why does, it, why does it exist? That's a good question. I, I think General Motors believed that there was going to be more demand for it. And, uh, you know, they're not, in fact, you know, they used to have this collaboration with Fiat, and then they had to give Fiat $2 billion to buy themselves out of the joint venture. And they've pulled out of Europe and just about everything. They have kept that diesel engineering center in Italy. So clearly GM thinks there's, there's 
like you to use your term, Lindsay, a lot of headroom in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just it's just a shame. I, and and adding that price premium to a car in that segment in this market doesn't make any sense. When they're probably not making any money on the cruise, much money on the cruise anyway. Right. So if they, so if they put it in, let's say a Cadillac CT6, would it make sense? No, no. It, there would be no demand for it. Yeah, that's the issue. It might drive great, get good fuel economy, it, all that good stuff, but. In passenger cars now, there's just next to zero demand for a diesel engine. So the Silverado, the F-150, the Ram 1500, Colorado they would, Canyon. They, yeah. would, they would be They'll their, be their proper uses for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think oh, yeah. So. No. In, in fact, I, I like to point out diesel engines in trucks, and I'm not talking heavy-duty trucks. I'm talking light-duty trucks equal the sales of hybrids, electrics, and plug-ins just about put together. So that shows how much demand there is on the diesel side when it gets to the truck segment. That's a good point. And some people in Europe have made the point that as vehicles are getting bigger over there, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, there weren't many SUVs over there. Now there's larger, not for, not by our measurement, but there's larger vehicles. And still, that's uh, possibly a good application for them over there. Oh, mm -hmm. great application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more gasoline vehicles, the more CO2 there's going to be. But those gasoline vehicles are getting more efficient. They're getting, and, and they're getting and, hybridized. Uh, and, yeah, and they're getting hybridized. Right. And uh, so apparently, in, in speaking of Europe, as we are, and gasoline vehicles and others, that uh, I guess the new, uh, the worldwide harmonized light vehicle test procedure is going into effect on September 1st, which is causing a certain amount of consternation over there in terms of... Uh, um, how vehicles are tested because well you got to test them but yeah. they all have yeah. to be tested right and, and apparently every variation every model it, right it, look it's stupid and uh, let's backtrack a minute Europe forever has had the easiest breeziest tests there are yeah. their regulations looked really tough their emissions regulations the NEC looked, on paper yeah. they looked tough but the tests were so easy. So now there's been a complete backlash and with all the diesel cheating and all that sort of stuff, now they're saying you have to test them on the road. It's not necessary. We have million dollar laboratories that can simulate all this stuff. But yeah. because the industry cheated, the industry has earned its own black eye. It's earned this this over-regulation. It's not needed, yeah. but that's what we're left with. Yeah, I was with some engineers this week that said already EPA in Ann Arbor is backed up from the normal cycle of uh, affirming vehicles and, and certifying vehicles because of this. I mean, all you do is throw one diesel diesel truck into the mix down there, and that particular dyno cell gets locked up for a lot longer than it had been. Look, I've seen, I, I, I put a picture on social media. I uh, found an EPA car with this stuff sticking off the back end of the vehicle. It even had a Honda generator on it to run all the emissions collecting equipment on it. It was a Hyundai Sonata hybrid. And you were in traffic and just snapped? Yeah, just oh, snapped that's cool. picture. It even has its own EPA government license plate, not a uh, you know license plate for the state of Michigan where the EPA's got its uh, lab. But uh, this is just going to add uh, you know, a horrific amount of time. I don't think the expense is so much. It's the time to test all this stuff that's going to be a real issue. Now, Will, you know, we know with turbocharged engines uh, that they don't really deliver what the promise is. Will this help solve that delta? Tighten up that delta. The promise no. in what regard? The, the, the promise of, of fuel economy and emissions for those engines. No, because the, the fuel economy is determined by FTP 75, right? You know, right. federal test procedure 75. That doesn't change. So that's how your fuel economy label is going to be determined. And, and my understanding is, and, and I might be wrong on this, I thought that the, the real world on the road testing right. was for emissions, not for fuel economy. Yeah, just wondering, as CO2 becomes more of a emissions and fuel economy oh, there's your, there's your issue. Picture. Yeah, oh, there, there's my picture. That's yeah. a great photo. Yeah. yeah. And that, that was just driving down uh, US 23, mm -hmm. and uh, I cropped it so you couldn't see the top of the dashboard of the mm -hmm. car I was in. It's just like some f family going camping with, yeah, their, that's right, with, their, with their Honda generator. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, that's a great shot, John. Yeah, no, I, I, I was stunned when I saw the car there with all that stuff off the back. And, uh, but, you know, it, it still comes down to what's our real goal here right. as a society we yeah. want cleaner air right. let's do it the smart way and loading up the industry with all these regulations and new tests uh, procedures 
is not necessary. I understand why it's being done, but we, we can cut a lot of that cost. But, by your, but, yeah. but as you pointed out yourself, they brought it on themselves. They brought it on themselves. Yeah. So was it, was it, it wasn't like yeah. there was, you know, the nanny state was making right. them do yeah. this. It was right. just like, you know, okay, guys, here are the rules. Follow the rules. Oh, you didn't do that? Well, there you go. I, I found some numbers this week on a, on a completely different subject, which really surprised me, and I didn't save it for next week for the doctor data section. But... So there's this outfit called CB Insights, which is a data aggregator and analysis firm. And they, they had a chart showing the top patent players in autonomous vehicles. And the company that has the number one patent um, grouping for autonomous vehicles is a big surprise to me. Guess, guess what it is? I, I would first think Waymo. Yeah, same here. They're, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. They're fifth out of six. Yow. Okay, who's number one? Ford. What? Oh, huh. Hmm. You know, Ford's 103. been at, at it a long time. So, okay, but to be fair, they separate Google from Waymo. Okay. So if you were to combine uh, Google and Waymo, then that would yeah, be yeah. ahead substantially. Does this include Argo with Ford? It must. I mean, it says Ford Motor Company, 103, Google, 100, Toyota, 77, Uber, 77, GM, 57, Waymo 56, and Baidu 42. Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, it's but, also but in Ford. I mean, it's. Well, yeah. Ford actually has been involved in autonomy for a long time. They were in the DARPA challenge. And, and I only found this out years later. In fact, I think Larry Burns talks about it in his book. Right. Ford secretly entered a vehicle in the DARPA challenges, never made a big deal about it being, it, Ford being involved in Did that. Did it finish? Um, it. I believe it did finish hmm. in, in the second and third DARPA channel. So it was in the urban one as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 right. Oh, it's interesting. Yes, right. Oh. And uh, so I, I can understand where Ford's got a lot of patents, but the other thing is I personally believe GM slash cruise automation is ahead of Ford right now. And I know companies sometimes decide not to patent technology because once you patent it, it's, it's, it's public, public domain, information. Right. Yeah. And then others can look at it and figure out, okay, how do we change this design a little bit so that we don't violate the patent? But you've already given away too much info. I wonder if that's the case here, too. Well, speaking of patents, and this, this, is, this is fairly scary, I think. Um, so LexisNexis, the data... Data search aggregation yeah. search firm. This got its sixth patent related to telematics and connected car related issues. Now I'm quoting, the patents cover technologies developed by the business to ingest, analyze, normalize, store, and distribute connected car data and now covers 60% of the world's production. So, so basically here's this, this firm so, that basically has yeah. a patent to hoover up yeah. the information wow. and then the slice, dice, and rice it. And, uh, it's just, scary. Yeah, uh, it's scary. Isn't, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Not from their perspective, it's nope, money. Right, it's money, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah it's money, but I mean, it's just like, man, I mean, uh, yeah. it's, it's just. That's what future vehicles are going to be. Hoovering is, is really right on. It's uh, their, their data suckers, mm -hmm. basically. Look, this is where the money is in autonomy. Right. It's not in making autonomous cars. It's not in making all the technology for them. It's in monetizing the data in those cars. Right, mm -hmm. right. That's an interesting statistic, though, yeah. there with, uh, with the IP. Mm -hmm. yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Hey, so, we, we've got some more questions from, from the audience. I, I hope I'm saying this uh, name right. Hey, Aleph Paye says, please speak about opportunities for studying and working in the automotive industry for people who are coming from outside of the U.S. Uh, thanks. I've learned many things from your shows. Hmm. SAE? <laughs> Well, I, I'd say, um, you know, you've got a couple hubs in the U.S. You've got the Detroit um, milieu and you've got L.A., Stanford, Silicon Valley, et, et cetera. We're already seeing some cross-pollination between them. It's very expensive out there. Michigan's a much more of affordable you know, place to arrive. I mean, they both now have ecosystems where you've got, uh, you know, tiered suppliers. You've got manufacturing. You've got academia. Same thing with Silicon Valley. Um, if you can afford to live out there, great. I mean, it, it's go to technical events, sign up for stuff, um, network with people. Yeah. I think it also depends what do you want to do. If you want to be an engineer, right? Yeah, you know, Stanford, University of Michigan, MIT. Uh, what's the one in uh, 
the, the research triangle down south, uh, Clemson oh, yeah. has got a big uh, automotive program. Tweet bar, yeah, yeah. And for, that's engineering. If you want to get into design, then you should look at the uh, uh, College for Creative Studies in Detroit, in Detroit CCS, and Art Center, Art, Art Center, Center in Pasadena, Pasadena California, mm -hmm. and, and there's other uh, industrial design schools too. If you want to get into business, you know, you probably just get an MBA at just about any school. But so, Lindsay, do you have do you have any idea of what types of automotive engineers are in the greatest demand now? Anything having to do with ADAS and sensor arrays. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. Uh, we, we, just, we just published an article on this. Uh, they're the, like the three top things right now as we move into autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the industry can't find engineers and you know, there haven't been degrees in sensor fusion, that kind right. of thing. So uh, uh, the basic place to start is an electrical engineering degree mm -hmm. today. You know, it sort of strikes me, though, you know, we have this cut body here in the studio. And I mean, and so much of that vehicle comes down to, you know, mechanical engineering, structural engineering, right. materials engineering. Right. And, and, and these are things that I think that, you know, as, as long as, as you have a structure that is transporting people, yeah. that these sorts of things cannot be overlooked. It, nobody talks about them anymore. No, I know, yeah. because it's no longer the, the sexy growth stuff. You know, it's all about coding and electronics. That's the sexy stuff. But yeah. you're absolutely right, Gary. You know, even when you have an autonomous car, uh, it has to be as thoroughly engineered as everything that we've got today. And even if we get to a world where there are almost zero crashes, they're not going to be exactly zero. And in that once in a lifetime opportunity or, or occurrence, where an autonomous car has to make an absolutely hardcore emergency lane change, the dynamics of that vehicle are going to have to be impeccable. So e even going into the future with autonomy, we're going to need hardcore engineering that goes into the structure, suspension, powertrain, all that. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. These guys are not getting in the popular press, as you, you two know. They're not getting the credit that they deserve. Uh, they've been pushed aside into kind of like a 20th century box while we talk about electrification, we talk about autonomy, et cetera still enormously important. And, and I think there's probably a lot of people in structural engineering and chassis engineering that are going to be retiring. So that we're, the industry is going to have to backfill right. these jobs. Yeah, there could be perhaps even more opportunity there. Could be more there. opportunity, right, mm -hmm. right. Well, look at all the new car companies getting into this right now. Yeah. And I'm not even talking about the ones in China, per se, but all these... Uh, Lucid, Faraday, yeah, Tesla. Yeah, Rivian, Neo. SF. You know, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's even more car companies in, when we all heard the experts predict a decade ago, there's only going to be three car companies left in the world. Yeah, <laughs> it be, hasn't happened there, yet. There could, yeah, yeah. Be, there, could, there could be an explosion of, of the number of car companies that, that are out there. Could be, could be. And uh, the ones John just mentioned, many of them are based on the West Coast. So mm -hmm. we could have kind of return to some West Coast automaking as well. Right. And, and they're going to need people who are going to know how to put this. So, Absolutely. so to answer the question, I mean, there, there's a plethora of opportunities. I mean, this industry, right. which, which as you said, you know, there's going to be there's going to be three car companies and, and they're going to be hobbling because yeah. uh, the, the auto industry is, is old technology, it's rust belt, it's dead, uh, yeah. right? That's right. And, and here we are, exploding. Right. Let's see, we got maybe three more questions right. we get to from the audience. Barry Rector from Indy says, what's your take on the new Chevy Blazer? I saw it uh, at the Woodward Dream Cruise last weekend. Looks like just another crossover to me. Mm. I've only seen pictures of it. I've only seen, seen pictures of it, too. Uh, but, you know, it makes a good point. And, and we talked about um, the new Acura Here's here. Here's a picture of it. Yeah, I mean, you look at the grill. I mean, first thing I think is Lexus. I mean, yeah, they've, Toyota, they've, they, yeah, they've adopted that big uh, Toyota Lexus grill on the car. Uh, the the, the C-pillar kind of looks like... What's it, uh, Range Rover, maybe, maybe yeah. Hyundai Kia. Maybe um, Nissan, even. May, maybe Nissan as well. I mean, it's a great name. I think it's a, a, a nameplate that still has some resonance. That's a good question. So, so where do you guys see this? Okay, so they, they have the Traverse, which is three-row. They have the Equinox, which is two-row. And now they have the Blazer. Yeah, well, the Blazer one seems to be much more lifestyle, performance, young, energetic, you know. Isn't that the Equinox? The Equinox to me now yeah. doesn't seem young, energetic lifestyle. It yeah, just seems it, to be. it's more like what Ford, Bronco is to Ford, and that's the way they used to be too. Is Blazer and Bronco? So maybe they're looking for another battle here. Mm -hmm. you know.
Okay, Chuck Grenchy says, how much impact are the California fires having on CO2? How many cars does it take to produce as much as is being produced? I don't know the answer. It's a great question. All I question. can tell you is uh, the air quality on the West Coast, not right now from those fires, is, is bad. I've seen pictures of Portland, yeah. Oregon, and Seattle. And uh, I mean, the, the, the air People looks with like, masks on. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean, it looks like uh, yeah. Beijing or something. The air well, so and a, a couple of weeks ago, you and I were out in Jackson Hole, right. and we were told that what we thought was uh, cloudiness over a little bit of haze, the mountains and the haze was actually the uh, smoke from those fires. Yeah, look, I mean, nature can put out a lot of pollution. And, and the volcano in Hawaii. They're, they're enormous in right. terms of what they scatter. Right. You know? I mean, that, that's not to say, oh, well, then, see, we don't really need emission controls. Mm -hmm. I mean, because Earth on its own can clean itself up. Earth plus all the pollution right. that humans are putting out woo, makes it real tough for Earth to mm -hmm. clean itself up. Yeah. Right. It's like those farting cows that were putting <laughs> all that um, methane in the uh, <laughs> atmosphere. That's exactly right. Well, hey. One more or no? Uh, well, uh, it, it, we sort of talked about this earlier. Al Alexander Karabitsis wanted to know what's the, the take rate on the Equinox diesel. Uh, I think it's probably about as low as it is on the Chevy Cruze. M maybe I'll look those numbers up for uh, next week's show, okay. but the take rate has not been that great. You know, the interesting thing here is, as we know, with Volkswagen, the diesel owners for Volkswagen were really loyal. Some of them have kept their TDIs. I mean, you still see them out on the streets. As much as money as Volkswagen was offering, they haven't given these cars up yet. So what happens to that hardcore diesel passenger car owner that has had two or three and put millions of miles on these things uh, in, that, in that sector? Uh, what happens to them? They buy an electric VW. Yeah, no, I mean, isn't that what we're, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, th that's the way they'd want that to go. But, but, you know, th that engine had a real hardcore following. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, look, diesel owners are the most loyal in yeah. the business. If, if you look at almost any segment, if it's got a diesel in it, those buyers are the most loyal to that brand. But they're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, yeah. there's nothing else to say. Right. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that engine's got a black eye right now. And like we talked earlier, in trucks, no problem. Yeah. But pass car, man, it's just not happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tragic. It is. Okay, probably time to wrap this show right. up. But Lindsey Brook, thanks so much for coming on. John, Always thanks great so to much. have you on the thanks show. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, kudos to the people at Acura for getting Stephen Fry here in this yeah. cutaway, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, Gary, good seeing you. All right. We'll do it again next week. How about doing that? Okay. <laughs> and we'll invite all of you to join us then. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. Ask Autoline is the newest program in our lineup. It's a live show on YouTube that occurs weekly, usually around lunchtime. Each episode kicks off with John McElroy giving an opinion on a topic he thinks is relevant to the auto industry. And then it's opened up to viewer questions, so you control the direction of the show. Check out these snippets from recent shows. What Tesla has done is taken all the electronics of the car and put them on several motherboards, and they all reside in sort of this electronic center under the back seat. I think it's time for GM, Ford, and FCA to merge their powertrain operations together. Joey's cleaning lady says, Tesla is the king of vertical integration. Yes, it is. In fact, they probably make too much in-house. NC says, what do you think about combining ride sharing and mass transit in subscription monthly pass like for people that do commuting? Brilliant idea, NC. I like that idea a lot. Mohamed Amini says, is there any startup working on recycling batteries? Not to my knowledge. And this is a, bit, a great issue that you, you raise because right now, nobody knows how to recycle lithium ion batteries for electric cars in volume and for a profit.
We didn't even talk about Tesla once. Yeah, we didn't. It's That's for, okay. First show ever. That's okay. Are, are we off mic now? No, no, we're still live. Okay. Yeah. So have you guys driven anything lately that's good? I just got back from the Ram uh, e-tour. Oh, yeah. Trip. yeah. Uh, which I can. Yeah? Yeah. It, truck's really good. It, ha having attended the Silverado launch a week before last as mm -hmm. well. I mean, pickups are getting really, really good in terms of NVH reduction. Unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. And, but the technology in this truck, you know, they had that the chassis that they had uh, before the auto show. It showed everything. I think this vehicle is probably the most technologically advanced, sophisticated pickup in the market, and it rivals some cars. When you look at all the systems talking to each other, now 48 volt, they've got cylinder deactivation, they've got great brake blending, they've got a lot of NVH uh, acoustic amendments on the on the chassis. Um, really, really impressive what they've done up there. Mm -hmm. so you know, it's more impressive than the uh, dynamic cylinder deactivation they have on the Silverado. You know, I thought about that, but adding the 48-volt system in, I, I, I would give the tech edge to, to Chrysler right now. And, and, you know, they didn't rule out, the guy who was their electrification engineer there, they, they didn't rule out going to the Tula system. I mean, we hit them at, at dinner on, you know. Well, they can't right now. GM's got an exclusive they, on They've it. got an they exclusive on it. But, but, but it, when you see the way these things are evolving. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it gives them 48 volts, as you guys know, gives them a lot of power, you know, on the truck now where they can do a lot more. Right. You know, they really hit the limit with 12 volts. Now, now are they using this for start-stop primarily and not, Torque. Stop start is really good. It's it's a primary thing. There's you get still, a good torque boost. You get a real torque boost, maybe 90 foot pounds. But you know, just that start. No. No, through acceleration, and and I think it starts at about 400 RPM. I mean, it's it's a little bit unfair. I I haven't driven the Jeep with a two liter. I have. When you've got a 3.6 liter V6 and a, particularly the Hemi, they're so torque rich to begin with that it's hard to really. I mean. Uh, on a long lead, as you guys know, it, it, it's really hard to discern. When we get them around here and can have them for a week, it's a different, right. it's a different story. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe two to three MPG uh, with this system. Uh, real nice on diesel down a long hill. You kind of lift a little bit, and there's a little bit of brake drag. You know, when you're going down a real big hill, following really you mean engine brake and engine braking. You know, real, real, uh, real, real nice on that. Um, They've done a great job. And when you look at FCA, I just wrote an editorial about this, how they just about, the program was almost dead. You know, they did the two mode with BMW, you know, in the Daimler days, BMW and GM. They did like a handful of pickups for DOE. They were like, um, you know, moving power plant kind of pickup trucks. Uh, and between then and Pacifica Hybrid, they did nothing. And, um, you know, I, I think for, all the acclaim that Sergio deserved, holding a bunch of programs back, including electrification, even though he was honest about saying, I'm losing 11 grand for, on every 500E. 20 grand, he upped it to later. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he's absolutely right. All right. But, but it put them in a hole. So what's helped them is partnerships with Conti and Magnetti Morelli on these systems. And it really kind of got them back in the game. So yeah. tr truck feels great. Mm -hmm. Right Knight writes in to say the fully loaded, full-size truck is the new large American luxury sedan. Yeah. Yeah. No question. Scott C. says, true, look at the Lincoln Navigator. It's large, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so the, uh, there's two different 48-volt systems, E-Torx, right. V6, yeah. V8. I know Continental makes the V6 one. V6 and the 2-liter in the Jeep. And, and that's who a does the V8? Uh, Magneti Morelli. Oh, really? And that's an air-cooled system. Oh, and they've even designed this when you open the hood that the generator is up high. I mean, both of these systems are designed for water fording, believe it or not. So, and the battery is up high. The battery has two fans in it. The air-cooled motor in the, on the Ram engine has two motors in it. So it's going to be pretty tough to kill. Mm -hmm. These yeah. systems. Mm -hmm. Lost in the curve says the price of pickup trucks is becoming out of reach. Market may tank if the economy has a correction. Well, they everything yeah. is going to tank if the economy right. corrects, but yeah. they are expensive. Yeah. But, but well, you, and, can, and you can still buy the. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's one of the things Silverado basically has that that base model vehicle. Still thirty grand. Yeah, but you get. I mean, just figure it out by the pound. It's thirty grand. <laughs> have a hell of a deal. And, and FCA has kept. 
the 2018 truck in production, and they're calling right. that the classic. Right. And the, the base price delta between uh, starter 2019 and starter 2018 is about $4,000. Wow. So that's enough to make you think, you know. How long are they going to keep building the old one? It's a good question. Don't know. As long as they can sell there, them. There's still some volume coming out of Mexico. Right. Um, you know, uh, so they're kind of mixing have, and matching right have now. Have they gotten over their launch problems with the new RAM? Because they, they had issues. Yeah, they had new, I know. And, I know. you know, I think part of keeping the old one was an insurance policy. Well, I see several things. Number one, go after the, the fleet market with the old truck. Yeah. Uh, maybe the, the old truck is uh, a strategy against midsize Ford Ranger, Chevy Colorado, Toyota Tacoma, blah, 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 because you, you can compete on price with a bigger truck. Uh, I think it's intriguing what they're doing, but I've, I've wondered how long are they going to keep doing it? Right, right. Well, I mean, it's, you know, these three guys are cranking out the volume. These are the products that are funding autonomy, yeah. electrification, yeah. you know. Bonuses. Bonuses, <laughs> right. <laughs> I forget this autonomy right, stuff. Right, it's right. like, come on. You know, That's right. I know. Right, they got to take this car apart. Yeah, they got to do that. We got to let the crew go home. Are, are we off mic? Yeah. I just wanted to bring up I one thing. Take, take it off. Take it off. Okay. So, huh?